Okay. All right. Well, welcome everybody to the second in a planned three-part series on the ethical challenge. Uh, Rabbi Chaim Metzger, as I mentioned last week, is going to be speaking uh, to uh, to present the session today. Um, he's going to introduce the session. He'll introduce himself as uh, as well. But I'll mention that Rabbi Metzger is new with our Beit Midrash. He joined us in August, came in from Israel. As you may have just heard, he's at Gush Etzion. Um, but don't worry, his English is perfect. Uh, and, uh, and I think you're really going to enjoy the opportunity to learn with him this morning. I will also note that Rabbi Sammy Bergman gives the last session um, next week, God willing. His topic is a personal favorite, um, Rabbis and Taxes. So that'll be, uh, that'll be this coming Wednesday. But uh, for now, Rabbi, Berg, Rabbi Metzger is going to talk about billing for unproductive time. I'll also put in a, a personal pitch. Um, if people could please, uh, to the extent you feel comfortable, turn on video. Uh, Rabbi Metzger doesn't know you yet. So uh, this would be a nice opportunity for him to meet you. And hopefully, God willing, when we do our next series in May, he'll be able to see you at uh, live and in person uh, and enjoy lunch together with you. Without further ado, Rabbi, take it away. All right, thank you, Rabbi Tarchiner. Um Hi, Chaim Metzger here. Happy to meet everybody, digitally at least. So I'd like to start off by thanking Zeithmans for, for hosting us. I'll be digitally this time. Hopefully soon it'll be in person again. Um, so uh, I've been posting in the chat the story sheet. Please feel free to download it. It'll hopefully help with following the rest of of today's proceedings. So we're gonna so I'd like to start off by before we get to the actual Torah to start by thanking our, our sponsors. This, this class is dedicated by Josh Frankel, Uli Nishmas, Batsheva Blima, La Shalom, Hui Ms. Dearly, and recognizing her of Moshe Yosef Halevi Yeres for his incredible efforts in spreading Torah. It's also been dedicated by Jeremy and Adasa Pertman, as well as Malka and Ellen Rutt. So to today's topic. Billing for unproductive time beyond accountant's control. So what does that mean, right? There's a lot of big words there. So but what are we actually going to be talking about? For this, I've brought a couple of cases, which I will explain the outline of both of the types of cases, as well as the general structure of this year. So hopefully we'll be able to have a better grasp as we move on through. So first, I'm good. there's two sets of cases. There are some vignettes referring to an individual as to how they relate. To, uh, to the, how each of the individual relates to, you know, billing themselves. And then we're gonna move on to some cases that, that happened in Canada over the past couple of decades involving the requesting the employment, the, the payment from the employer. And then we're going to move to some of the halakhic issues that may not be involved. And then finally, and then and then we'll go back to some cases, both in the Gemara as well as circling back, hopefully, to our original cases as well. So before we actually get to the sources, I want to remind everybody: please message me with your both your name as well as your email. That way, we can give you credits for uh, having having attended, so you can everybody can get their professional development credits. So please uh, send it to me either privately in the chat, um, and and please and or. Um, yeah, please send it in the chat, then, then hopefully I'll have it at the end, and that way you'll be able to both, to both have your name listed for having been here, as well as send you the certification afterwards as well. So please make sure to send me your name um, or post it in the general chat, emails as well if you think that Rabbi Trichina or I don't have it. Okay, so now let's jump into the first case. So, whenever, so at any point, please feel free to interrupt me, shout out, right? Feel free to unmute yourselves, um because this is meant to be interactive it's not just me giving giving a monologue so please um so please uh right so please uh make sure to chime in so first case on a computer programmer spends all day working on his laptop just before the end of the day the computer crashes and the work done all day is lost can he still expect payment what do we think I'm seeing some shakings of heads. No, does anybody think he 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 should get paid? I got I got some yeah I got a I got a message to me yes. Wait so so why yes why no? I think, I think we get uh, paid for our output rather than our efforts. Unfortunately, in this in the business world. 
Okay. And if he's not present producing anything, despite the fact that he made best efforts, I'm not sure that he uh, can get paid for that time. Um, is, is it possible that it might depend on his status? Is he a kablan where he's being paid for the job? Or is he a sahir where he's just a worker being paid by the hour? Correct. Those are, those are all definitely possibilities. So again, so, so who said he should be paid? That was, I think that was, I saw, I think uh, Debbie messaged me. Well, what did you think? Why do you think that he should? Um, okay. Uh, I see this is from somebody met, uh, private message me um, saying that Elda, uh, let me expand the chat so I can read the full name. So Eldon. Um, so he says that anyone in the profession that doesn't back up frequently um, does not deserve to be paid. Excellent point, right? So it's your like it's your fault. So what do you expect to get paid when it's when it's your fault? Okay, good. Okay, so now we've got some ideas of why it should go this way or that way, and who should be responsible or not responsible. Okay, so so seemingly we were all pretty much agreed. Oh, and he, oh, he also said that I would fire him as well. Um, so okay, so that's so seemingly we don't like the computer programmer. We think he's, he, yeah, definitely not getting paid. Okay, so let's go to the next case. Jill experiences a power connectivity outage while consulting and loses fifteen productive minutes of her workday. Does she need to make it up after hours? So, was she working on site of the person who she's doing the work for? Let's say no. Let either way. Yes, if she was working on their site and their system went down, why should she have to uh, take the hit? Maybe if she was at home, it may be different. Right. So, right. So again, whose system is it? Is it the is it the is it the employers or the employees? That could make a difference. What else? What else might be a factor for this? So we're all pretty much assuming that if assuming that it's that, so that would mean that if it's employ if it's the employee's fault, like it's their network, they should pay. But if it's the employer, then they would not. Okay. Um, let's see, uh, Eldon is messaging that. No, this this would be considered to be an onus beyond their, their control beyond her control because who is she to you know to even for her own house, who controls the who, who's they're not the one providing the uh, the the. Uh, the internet, the internet or the electricity, that's somebody else. Like I paid and that's all I did. So like, as in like I paid them and they're supposed to provide it. I can't make it better or worse. Okay. So the other question is, would anybody argue that maybe they should have, she should have had a backup even for the power or connectivity. Should she have, you know, paid two, two companies to make sure she had, you know, both, you know, let's say Rogers and Bell both providing her internet just in case one of their, their, their networks go down. Would that be necessary? Right, because it happens. I'm sure we've all been on Zoom long enough to know that somebody's internet's going to cut out for sure over the next hour. At least one person, if not more, possibly my own in the middle of a sentence. So, right. So then, is that should I have been, you know, made more redundancies? I think the key here is to, if the person is working on a project basis, they're working on an hourly basis. Who they're working for? That's the key. It depends on the contract of employment. Ah. What, what's written to the contract? Very good. All right. So that's also a very a very good point. Is what does the contract state, and what am I entitled to based on my contract? Because that could definitely change things a lot. Okay. So that we that's that we've got that was case number that was case number two. So case number three. Okay. So sick of working remotely from a small apartment, Jack decides to work remotely from his vacation home after flying to his cottage. He realizes he left his laptop at home and only has a smartphone to work with. So can he bill per hour at the same rate despite his lower productivity? So no. I'm seeing a whole bunch of sh shaking of heads. And anybody gonna, de gonna defend the guy on vacation? Looking, li looking like not, okay, fair. I didn't really expect anybody to, uh, um, to buy that, right? So seemingly, this is going to be a problem. We're right. Okay, so each of these cases, right? So we said reasons why they should, they shouldn't, and so the we've been, we, we we've we've the elements mentioned so far have been whose fault is it, degree of which they should have have been prepared, and also the question of 
what was stated in the contract. So now let's bring up something something else that might be relevant. So now now we're transitioning to um, you know to reality a little bit. So this is a, a case of a right of a of a plant that experiences severe blizzard. The question is how much do the employees get paid when they were sent home early by their boss? So right so the, no so okay, so we're saying that do they get the are they here we're, we're in, now we're in source number one so again so again so in the in the so in the second line so are they are entitled to be paid for the full shift or for the minimum four hour reporting allowance provided under article 13 of the collective agreement so the company sent them all as employees in the day in question so seemingly from here this sounds like it's a purely business purely business based on the contract but then when we get to the details that are included in the case when it's presented in court we see the practice of the company in the past has been to compensate employees for a full shift when they're sent home afternoon for whatever reason. This has happened once or twice per year for a number of years. The union maintains on some of those occasions, the employers have been sent home before noon. So then in terms of these, some more of the details of the case, so Mr. Candless, who, um, who had been in charge of the plant um, at the time, decided to close the plant in order to ensure the employees could return home and the employees punched out shortly before 9.30 a.m. So not only did they not, they barely even started then because normally the hour starts, the day starts at eight, they left by 9.30. And also the storm, although it disrupted travel outside the plant, had no effect on the work inside the plant. The decision had not been made to close the plant. There was sufficient work to occupy all employee, all 45 employees for the balance of their shift. So seemingly the this would might indicate that the fault, meaning that the workers, their leaving was to their benefit, not because the, the the owner had to do so, but it's simply so that we can get home on time or get home period. So should that make a difference? And last, we see that Mr. Candles or Candles spent spent an hour in the parking lot after the plant had been had been closed, assisting employees leave the parking lot. So how about this case? This looking like, you know, should they get paid for full, for part? What would we say? Here's a little stickier, because, you know, there's there's the contract says four, but, some, they, but sometimes they got paid, they got paid for all eight. And also they, their job was still there. It was just, you know, the they left because they wanted to make sure they wouldn't get stuck. So is that considered to be a valid excuse? So, I don't know. Were they told they had to leave or they were given the option to leave? Also a good question. So it appears that they were that they were given the option to leave. So some people stayed, but most people had had gone home. Like they were told that you're welcome to that, you know, we're not requiring you to, you're welcome to go home. I'm not sure if verbal if it doesn't seem that there's a verbal statement by Mr. Candles at the time for how much they'd be getting paid. This is all done post facto. But that's a good point. Again, what did he what 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 was uh what were, was it, were, they, were they sent to him or did they choose to go home? Okay, so again, this one's not quite as clear as our first three cases. Here, you could there's there's more factors, and also I'd like to highlight the fact that you know in previous practice there's a dispute as to what they even did. Sometimes they went home early and got full pay, sometimes not. So again, a little stickier. Okay, and now the 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 the, the last you know real case we have again this is source number two, bottom of page one. So this is a case involving a power plant. So even though you, you know, we mentioned before about the power went out, but what if the, what about the power plant? Is the power plant responsible? So this is Nova Scotia Power Incorporated. So this is this is based this is a government review saying did they do what they were supposed to do or not? So let's look at the the, the, the this is their, this is their after, after again there had been there had been a big storm 2014 and based because of what well, the storm I believe is called um, post tropical storm Arthur. So the question then is, 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 do we, are we going to fine the power plant for doing a bad job for, of being prepared for the storm or not? So what, what, so what are some of the things that are, that they're going to be considered to, that are potentially at fault for? And so, and we'll see whether we see, see, find these reasonable or not, and whether we think that this should have been billed for this or not. So the cause of the power outages, what failed, an outline of the restoration efforts, an explanation as to why it took the time it did to establish service. So they're asking, make sure you clarify, like give us your defense to see like, 
are we going to find you or not? You know, why do you take so long? You could have done a better job. Why do you do what you did? You should have done a better job. Next, details with respect to the communication system failures that appear to have taken place during the course of the storm, particular in light of the significant investigations and expenditures which were made on NSPI, meaning the power, the, that's the power company's system following a similar failure during Hurricane Juan and the storm of November 13th and 14th, 2004. And SBI should outline any action this take and proposes to take to correct the problems. So now we're saying that this isn't the first time this happened. Why weren't you ready? And if you have a reason, give it to us. If not, I don't know what to tell you, but you did something wrong. Okay. Third thing that they're, that they're, that they're, that they're correcting them for is the current practices with regard to vegetation management including specifically the infected areas and whether those practices need to change as a consequence of the failures during post-tropical storm Arthur. So now we're not insulting them for being vegetarians. We're saying, you're a power company. You know trees are gonna fall. Did you make sure to cut, you know, look like to, to, make, to, to remove all the trees that you knew would fall on top of it or not? Like, did you, do, did you look into this thing properly? And should you, did you, or is there anything new that happened? Like, you know, you did everything properly, but all of a sudden, you know, for some reason, you know, every tree just started flying around and knocked all, all, all the tree lines down. So is that your fault? To make this even more complicated, again, not that I mentioned there, is should they have it had a similar stance to that of what they do in Florida, which has tons of hurricanes, is they require by law that all power lines are underground because they were sick and tired of every single year of them being uprooted. So they're like, there's no way to properly control every tree. So we're gonna mandate that you should all just put it all underground. So is that, so is in, So did they go far enough or they didn't go far enough? There's a lot of these complicated questions before you can decide, are they required to pay or not? So now that we've discussed some of the theoreticals, let's bring this, bring this into the realm of, of halakha, right? What would Torah law have to say about this? So, now, so as everybody, now we're on page two. So I've listed some questions there. So I'll pose these to the audience. Please let me know if you have any um, good suggestions of all things halakhically that might be relevant or not halakhically that you think might be, might, might have a say in this. So in all these cases, so what is considered to be beyond one's control? And to what extent should you prepare for the unknown? So how much would we expect? Right, give, I'm gonna give examples of some things that are beyond your control, as opposed to things that you should have known better. In, in above cases, like in all the above cases, we have, you have five cases. What are some things that we consider to be beyond your control versus you should have known better? Act of God, force majeure. Right, force majeure, right? I think Kai mentioned, right, that there are cases, as for more on force majeure, um, um, please see um, Robert Trichino this year from last week. But yes, as in, at what point do we say that you know it's beyond what you could have you could have potentially expect, expected, and therefore you know it's, it's 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 governed by a different set of rules. So what what else is there anything else that that you like a particular example that you'd say would fall into more of a gray area than being a clear force majeure or being um, something else? Yes, Miriam. So this is a little bit of an outlying thought, but I'm thinking about when Yaakov speaks to Lavan and he tells them about him returning sheep to him that were stole. It says, gunav, gunav yom gunav laila. whether it was stolen in the day or the night, whether it was out of his control, if it was stolen in the night, he still felt he needed to compensate Lavan for sheep that were stolen in the night. So sometimes maybe there's an, I don't know, he was maybe incredibly ethical to, uh, to, to replace what was stolen in the night that was out of his control. Maybe right. sometimes it has to do with maybe someone's means. Maybe maybe we don't always have to look at who is at fault, but let's say in an employer-employee relationship, maybe one has much greater means than the other and, and there has to be some sort of uh, kindness on the part of the person who has greater means to compensate the other. So could be. Right, so that would, that would relate more to, you know, if Fanim Yishur Hadin, as I mentioned last week, you know, going beyond the letter of the law, like, isn't somebody who is, um, has greater means should do so because 
the other people are poor and you're required to take care of them, not because from a legal standpoint, but from a, you know, from, from an ethical standpoint. But you also want to make sure that, that there are, that quite, are you responsible for this case of, 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 of being stolen or not? So we're going to see that in a little bit, that different people are responsible for different things, right? Depending on what your role is in terms of, of, of uh, let's say like with Yaakov, right? So depending on what, what his relationship was with Lavan is whether or not he was required to pay or whether his payment was simply was, was nimish or adim beyond the letter of the law, him going above and beyond. And we'll, and we'll see that, okay? So that, that'll be in a couple, in, in, I believe uh, two pages. We'll get there, don't worry. Okay, so I, I'd like to, you know, give two operating, um, two, it's two polar opposites for the reason why you should be exempt versus why you should be um, required to pay in a given circumstance. So there's so there's two very strong factors in halacha that come up in this regard. One is ones, circumstances beyond our control, which had been mentioned earlier by, by Eldon, as well as the question of shia, negligence, right? You should have been more careful, but you weren't. So the tension between these two factors, right, is in beyond your control versus you should have known better. Between those two things, and depending which one ends up winning out, will be whether in a given case you have to pay or are exempt. So now let's, but in order to do this though, we have to establish better what constitutes beyond your control versus what point are you simply negligent, right? Ones versus Shia. Okay, so to, to this end, so um, let's go to the mission of Matsya. So we are going to. Uh, thank, thank you, Mary, for mentioning the, the shepherd case because we're talking about a shepherd right now. We can call him Yaakov. Okay, so Yaakov um, was, guard, was, guard, was guarding the flock. And then what happens? Again, we're in source number three. I'm going to read the English. If you'd like the Hebrew, the Hebrew is there as well. So if one wolf attacked the flock that, that Yaakov was watching, it does not count as an unavoidable accident. But two wolves do count as an unavoidable accident. So that's the first opinion. That depends on how many wolves. Okay, Ryuta says, in a time where wolves are commonly attacking the settlements, even one wolf is considered to be an unavoidable accident. So another case, two dogs do not count as an unavoidable accident. You do what the Babylonians said in the name of every mayor. If two dogs came from one direction, that's not an unavoidable accident. But if they came from two directions, they count as an unavoidable accident. So based on what we had about the, about, let's, we'll pause for the next part. So what do we think now based on the dogs and the wolves? So what, so what determines whether or not it's unavoidable or not? All right, how do we know? Like the level of the incident. Right, it depends on the incidents. Excellent, Eddie, right? It depends, right? We have to judge each case depending on how it works out. Sometimes it could be this way, sometimes that way. It really can depend. So now let's, because so, that's the question of like, is it a, when, when would you have expected this shepherd to be able to properly defend? Or what point do you say like, he did what he could, and that's that. So now let's go to, to another one. Okay, so bandits count, again, third to last line. So a bandit counts as an unavoidable accident. Okay, right? right, you know, you get mugged, right? Again, what could you have done better? Like, that was it. Similarly, a lion or a bear or a leopard or a panther or a serpent counts as an unavoidable accident. All things that, again, if you're trying to defend the flock, these aren't animals that we expect individuals to be able to defend against. Um, this is time before everybody had, you know, guns where it's relatively simple to shoot and kill them. Um, you'd have, you'd have tried, if you ever tried, uh, I'm sure nobody here has ever, you know, tried bullfighting, but rather trying to try to do bullfighting, it's, it's a pretty hard job, and that's where somebody's actually freshly trained for it, as opposed to you know just you know your ten year old your ten year old kid watching his jeep. Not necessarily a fair game, right? He's going to lose to these things no matter what. Like, yeah, he's not Hercules. He's going to die. That's just it. So, so then we're so then the last. Then now let's go to the, to the to the next section. So, but when is this the case? When are you fully exempt? When they come of themselves, right? When the bandits, you know, you're minding your own business, watching your flock, and then all of a sudden bandits come, right? Then that's considered to be beyond your control. But if you took the flock to a place of wild animals or bandits, they do not count as an unavoidable accident. 
if you decided to take your to take the flock of sheep to the day to the right past the hideaway where you know that there are bandits or you decide i know let me take my flock of sheep into the lion's den and then lo and behold the lions ate most of your sheep or even one or two of your sheep whose fault is that right so that seemingly would then fall into the issue of it being Right, so not only do we have a case of what's considered to be an un unavoidable, we also have the question of, did you do your utmost to avoid it? Right, so we have both, so we have both things going on here. The case of beyond your control versus you were simply negligent. Okay, so that was, so that's a case involving a shepherd, but that's not necessarily so helpful for us. So let's go to a case that's a little more directly connected to, to, to our case. So now we're on page three. So again, this is the following Mishnah in Baba Metzia. So now this is saying that this is an animal that you were you, that you were using to work. So if a, the beast died a natural death, this counts as an unavoidable accident, meaning that you don't have to pay. But if you tortured it and then it died, that's not an unavoidable accident. You know, you have to pay for that because you tortured it and therefore it died. You can't pretend that that was, I can't believe it happened. Similarly, if you let it up to the top of, the top of a crag and it fell down and died, this is not considered to be an unavoidable accident because why did you bring the animal to the top of a, of a mountain and expect it to be fine? Okay, so based on, so based on these, so normally what we'd expect, death is unavoidable. Right, you couldn't have done anything better, but what does this seem to indicate over here? That it seems to indicate that, well, it's only if the death was truly, you know, unexpected, but if you actually fully expected it to occur, it's your fault. And, and then we have at the end, we, so I, I believe, um, I believe Jerry had mentioned, um, um, had, had mentioned about, you know, what the contract says. So that's what we see right here. So that's the last, that's the last bit. So an unpaid guardian may make a stipulation that he will be exempt from taking an oath and a borrower make a stipulation that he'll be exempt from making restitution and a paid guardian and a hirer make a stipulation that they'll be exempt from taking an oath or from making restitution, which seems to imply that things have now changed. You are now available and it's entirely possible to, even everything we've talked about until now, you can make a condition that'll get you out of it. So the question then is, so what does this mean and how does this help us? So in order to better understand this, we're gonna to have to explain, well, what type of guardian are you? Meaning how much responsibility do you have in a given situation? Because depending on who you are and how and what degree you accept upon yourself or what conditions you'd written into your contract before will change what happens. So for this, um, so again, so it's, 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 this is quoted in the Mishnah of Metziah, but I think we're, let's, let's go through in the Rambam because he also quotes the original Psukim. So he's also some in the Gemara, which discusses this as well for us. So we're gonna skip to source number seven, but if you'd like to um, look at the Mishnah in source number five, it's there for you to look at, over afterwards. Just the Rambam is very good at making things clear. It's numbered. So hopefully it'll make a little more, it'll make it a little, little bit easier for everybody to follow. Okay, so here we go. So, Arba, so there are four guardians mentioned in the Torah, but only three rules go govern their liability. Okay, so now who are these four? Four guardians are a gratuitous guardian, meaning unpaid, right? The borrower, the paid guardian, and the hirer. I mean, the hirer meaning the person who had hired another person. I know it's not technical legal parlance. If somebody knows the proper word for that, let me know. Is it not a renter, someone who's renting? That last uh, right, somebody who's renting the who's rented the animal or or, um, or a car or, or whatever it is or hired the or, or right or hired the worker. So that's why I'm not right. Could be. Point is that if the Hebrew is you know there's the person who gets paid versus the person who's either he's the person who's either renting the item or the or the person who's renting the, either the item or the animal. So I guess renter might be a better term. Um, uh, but for that. Um, so translations from Safaria, so um, I, I can't claim to be, so again, for as far as the year, again, we can check, we can check the, 
don't worry about the, the word point thing is that that's a person who had we'll see that the that the paid guardian and the person who's hiring or somebody else are renting something fall in the same category so it'll, it'll it'll be okay so now the three rules that govern the liability are so and then we're that's so after i read the rules of liability we'll, we're gonna i'm gonna ask whatever where everybody thinks that the average worker falls in okay so a gratuitous guardian from whom the deposited object was stolen or lost, and needless to say, if it was overcome by a major accident, as in the case of an animal that dropped dead or was carried off, meaning by, by like a wolf or a wild animal, may take an oath that he has guarded it properly and be free from liability as it is written. When a man gives money or goods to another for their keeping and they are stolen from the man's house, the owner of the house shall depose before the judges. Okay, so that's that's the you know the you know, you, you told your you asked your friend do you mind watching my uh, you want to mind watching my animal or the modern case do you mind you know watching my well, you know watching my car watching my laptop all of a sudden somebody runs then then somebody runs through and steals it like was that his fault seemingly no because like he wasn't supposed to do such a great job and therefore like you know the fact that somebody managed to steal it from him isn't you know. You didn't really expect somebody to, you know, to try and like steal it from him. You're just like, you know, just make sure that nobody like, you know, walks by and takes it. You're just like, you know, just like if you had been in front of you, right, to make it roughly the same as that. So then, but there's another person. So then there's the borrower, right? So for the borrowers, he must make a restitution in every case, whether the object was lost or stolen or overcome by major accident. Ones would be the Hebrew word. Um, as when a borrowed animal dropped dead or was injured or carried off. So basically we're saying here the borrower is, 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 is liable in almost every single case. It's concerning the borrower is written, when a man borrows an animal from another and it was injured or died, its owner not being with it, he must make restitution. So if you had borrowed it, you have to pay. Even though you'd say, but uh, wait, but this isn't fair. The answer is, is that the borrower has a higher, seemingly has a much higher degree of liability than anybody else. Just to clarify, though, Rabbi, a borrower is not being um, charged for his use of it. He's just borrowing it for free, right? Right. Correct. This is so. This is the person who's borrowing it for free, right? You borrowed your, you know, your neighbor's tools, and then, you know. And then you know, like you borrowed the lawnmower, and then the lawnmower just you know up and dies. Is that your fault? Right, and that's the difference between that and a renter, where you're paying to use it. Correct. Okay. So also, what's one? So while we're talking about being responsible, I just want to remind everybody to, if you have not yet sent me your name, um, either a private message or put it in the chat, um, please do so. That way, we'll be able to give you your credit hours. Um, so again, please message, please message me or place in the chat with your um, name and contact information, verbally email. Okay. So, right. So, but there is one caveat uh, that we'll get to is that if it had with with a borrower that if it had that if the animal had died meto matmach malachto meaning if it had died in a way that you expect you expected to be using it that you will not be responsible for even for the borrower. So that if the person is you're simply mowing your lawn, and then all this and then it. And then, and then, and then the, and then the, I mean, because you said, I want to borrow the, the mower to mow my lawn. And then, you know, and then it, and then it, you know, somehow just cutting the grass makes it explode. That's not your fault because you did exactly what you're supposed to, yet it did that. So seemingly that's not your fault. So, but we need, so, we, so we need to figure out what precisely, uh, right? So, now we're, but, so that's what the case of the show all. Again, we'll have to discuss, you know, does that when the uh, extreme cases we'll leave, we'll leave aside for now. But again, seemingly he's, he's responsible for basically everything. So then now we get to the, the interim case, right? We had, right, we had the, per, the, 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 unpaid high, the unpaid guardian who is responsible for basically nothing. Then we had the borrower who's, respo who's responsible for basically everything. Then we get to the case of the person who's paid or if you rented it. So a paid guardian or a hirer are both subject to one rule. They are obligated to make restitution if either the hired object or the deposit 
for a fee was stolen or lost. But something worse happened through a superior force, as in the case of an animal that dropped dead or was injured, carried off, or torn by beasts, the, guardian, the paid guardian or the hirer may take an oath that the animal met with an accident and be released from liability. It is written, when a man gives to another donkey an ox, a sheep, or any other animal to guard, and it dies or is injured or is carried off with no witness about it, an oath before the Lord shall, be shall decide between the two of them. It is written, moreover, but if it was stolen from him, um, you shall make restitution of the owner. Okay, so here it's, it's so so over here we see that it's that there's a case in between, right? There are the cases that are beyond his control, but there's a certain degree that you should have known that you should have protected against things being stolen or lost. So the question is where so like so now we're in the middle there there is a whole bunch of, of, of wide variables going this way or that way. So hence so then. So now, again, to, to then Rama includes a nice summary at the end. So hence it follows that gratuitous guarding clears himself by his oath in all cases, right? So, I'm being, so he can just swear and then he's exempt. Bauer pays in all cases, except in the case of an animal that died from work, as will be explained why that's an exception. So again, that, that might be very relevant for our case of, of, of ONS, of, of, extreme, of extremely beyond your control. And the receiver of a fee or the hire pays for what is lost or stolen, but they may take an oath about the major accidents, namely about the injured or captured or dead or torn animal, or in a case where the object was lost in a shipwreck or was taken by armed robbers, and so too all similar major accidents. So now we see that there are three different, there, there are three groups, unpaid guardian, a borrower, and then the paid guardian or the person who has, um, or the person who has been um, in, in between, who is somewhere in between. So, right, so the, that's doing the hirer, the renter, or the guy who, the, the paid guardian. The question is, which one of these would we expect the average employee to fall into? What do we think? Paid guardian. Shomer Sachar. All right, I heard Eddie and Chaim both saying Shomer Sachar. And as far as whether or not that's the case, so you are exactly correct, as we see in the, in the, as in the Mishnah, we're going back up a little bit to the previous page, the source number six. Kol ha'umanin shomre sacharhein. So all craftsmen are considered to be paid guardians. And that's the degree of liability level that they're expected to have. That, so meaning, so anything that's like, you know, any of the, any of the items that they're, they're, ha that they're holding, let's say if you give somebody, your sh somebody, you know, you have them to go fix your laptop, so they're responsible to, you know, if it, if it, like I just say, if it was lost or stolen, like you know, the lost or stolen case would apply here, as well as the, if you know, like anything more extenuating, let's say like a fire, they got robbed. So that would all you, you judge that person based as if they are a paid guardian, which means that we'll have to, as opposed to let's say if it was a unpaid guardian, which is pretty clear that you're basically exempt, for, unless you know you did something, you you were negligent in some way, or as opposed to the borrower who says there's you're always responsible, except for, you know, certain supremely extenuating circumstances, very specific ones. There's a much wider range that deal with like, where does it fall with what, what, what happens with the worker in terms of, you know, being paid, is he responsible, or let's say, is he liable if something goes wrong on the project, All right? So, it depends. so again, so it'll depend. Do we consider that, like, let's say the first case of the guy whose computer crashed, is that his fault or not? And to what extent is it his fault or not? So we'll have to see where, where we, where we place that. Does it make a difference the level at which he is paid? Meaning the amount of money he gets paid or you're referring to the... Um, or... The amount you pay somebody to watch the item, if it's a token payment or if it's uh, your security guard, it's two different things. So once they're being paid, they're being paid, I believe, philosophically. Assuming that it's once it's more, once it's once it's once it's any amount of payment can 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 trigger the it being being a paid person. As in, like, is what is it? Even if it's let's say you know, oh, it's not uh, really you know, he he should be getting paid. You know, if he was a proper security guard, there's nothing else you have to deal with. As in, if it's a professional security guard as opposed to simply, you know, you know, the average worker, and should they be should they have been able to prevent against a case of robbery, let's say, right? You would expect the security guard to defend against it but you know the but you know would you expect the average employee to you know who's working you know let's say he's using the compute the, the company computer and he's sitting at starbucks and then somebody comes in and steals it so 
you would you would you'd probably hold your you wouldn't necessarily hold your employee at fault, but let's say if some but if he had been the security guard and that happened, then you would say the security guard's at fault. Right? So it might depend on like what he's hired for. Okay. So another uh, thing to, to bear in mind in terms of whether you're responsible or not, which was again, this was mentioned last week by Robert Tarchiner. The question is what it is considered to be accepted practice. Right, so what so what would we consider that to be? So all right, so again, so Rabatrina went into more depth last week, but basically the question is like you are you are basically limited to what is considered to be the expected um, response, what's considered to be within reason in the place of your work, and that's what, what, what that's what'll matter. Uh, by the way, do, are we going till 115 or 130? Just want to check. What was the 130 usually? 130 usually. Okay, just, just confirming to make sure so whether or not I had whether I had had to run through or not. Perfect. Okay, great. So we have plenty of time. I did I didn't make a mistake. Okay, good. Because that would be negligent of me if I forgot what time we if I forgot what time we were ending. So then I'd be responsible to pay everybody back in 15 minutes, which I don't know how I would do in this case. So don't worry, we'll get to a case involving whether or not the teacher is liable if we if we get through the Shilfanara. We'll get there. Okay. Right. So again, so so as far as the responsibility goes of the um, of the of the work of the of the of the worker, and what a lot of it might come down to what's considered to be expected of them. Right. What's accepted practice? As in, when you hire a security guard, what level of you know, protection are you expecting? You're expecting the you know he's as this a security guard. You know, for, let's say for um, you know for for the uh, for let's say for let's say uh, a government for a government official who's like expecting an assassination attempt, or is this you know like the you know the the, the security guard you put at the mall the basic job is to you know um, tell you to you know you know don't run and that's basically all his job is right so which one is it right because depending on what's expected of him is whether or not you'd say he's responsible or not and also the question here is as far as the work conditions right so that can also make a big difference. Right, so because the, the in the mission there, it's talking about you know coming early to work, going home. So maybe or going or leaving early in time to get home. So maybe we should we we should question whether or not you're responsible. So let's say for what's what would a normal employer expect in any of these cases? Should they would they have expected you to have been prepared, or no that this is something brand new and like you should have had no idea about it, and therefore if it happens, you tried, and that's all we can expect of you. So now, we're, so again, I just want to like to remind everybody, please, um, um, please sign in if you have not yet. And again, send me your name as well as your email. That way we will be able to um, have a record of, of, uh, of everyone. Okay, so now, well, let's, so now let's get to some cases, right? So how do we go into practice of when does due, due diligence come up or when does it not come up? Right? When are we considered to be responsible or not responsible? Does it matter between the employer versus employee? So for this, we're going to jump ahead a little bit in history. We're, we're, we're going to go to straight to the Shulzhan Aruch, right? Written by Rehuda of Cairo in the 16th century. So where he, he codifies a lot of laws, right? That's what it is, it's a law book. So he's gonna have a lot of cases. We're currently in, in the park called Social Mishpat, which is deals specifically with business law. And we're gonna see what the case is. So I'd just like to point out that almost all these cases that are listed here are actually in the Gemara and Bava Metziah, um, right? We were before recording the Mishnah. So in the Gemara following the Mishnah, we had been reading, this is where all, most of these cases come from. Just, I figured it might be a little bit easier if we skip to the Hebrew as opposed to the Aramaic, and it would hopefully save us a little bit of time so we can get a little more discussion out of it. So we're going to read through, and then I'm going to pause, and you can, and you, and can we're going to see whether or, not we, whether or not we think that they should be responsible or not. Okay, so... If one, so, okay, so we're at now we're in source number nine on page number five. Okay, so if one hires a worker to irrigate a field from a specific river and the river dried up halfway through the day and its practice is generally that it does not dry up or even if its practice was to dry up but the worker knew the practice, the worker will suffer the loss and the employer would not pay him anything even if the employer also knew the river's practice. If the worker did not know the practice of the river, but the employer did, however, the employer must pay him like an idle worker. 
So based on this case, so who's so who's who are the various responsible or irresponsible parties we have here? Who do we have? If the, if the employer knew, then it's his responsibility. Right, but it's modified by that if the worker also knew, then he's not responsible. The worker doesn't have to be more responsible than the person who hired him. Right, but sometimes here the case the case just said that the worker here, even if the employer also knew, means if the if, if the let's say if the employee was happened to have been an expert like lived here locally also, and he knew that there, there's, there's a good chance of it drying up. That means that would imply that everybody knew it could dry it could dry up. So therefore, it's like I hired you. You, you know, you expected that it would go as far as it went, and the initial assumption would be that since all parties have equal access to the knowledge that you knew that it might very well dry up and you accepted the job anyways because you're because you were betting on it being being okay and we both bet similarly with the same degree of circumstances so therefore i'm not it's not my fault but right so so this seems again it's a little complicated again when it is the employer versus the employee and here it seems that maybe if they both have the same degree of liability that maybe the employee would not be getting paid yes Miriam. But an employee who's told to come somewhere and should show up, if they don't show up, then that's not so good. And maybe the onus is totally on the employer. They, the employer knows that there's a chance, but he says show up anyways. The employee is very beholden to the employer. Why should they in any way suffer, even if they could have said, you know, I, I, I know that it sometimes dries up. But you need to show up because the employer told you to be there. Otherwise, you're not their employee. You're not following their instructions. Correct. So, right. So it comes down to the question of is this considered to be beyond the somebody's control or not? Like, should somebody have done something done more in this circumstance? Right. Is it, could we should we say that the employer shouldn't have sent him or not? And also the question is like, is it is this a, something unfortunate that happens? right then and there versus when it happens later on. And that's, and that's also a very relevant point. Is it if when everything started, right, we all, like it, it should have been fine, most likely it would have been fine, but you know, it could happen and you're both aware of it, then and you both have equal, um, that equal equal risk in this, then, maybe, then, then we'd say that maybe that you can't demand payment because you did everything that you could. But here, maybe that might not be the case. So we're gonna get more into the details of what is, of what is beyond versus not beyond your control, because here, Right, knowing the, you know, like say, knowing the way that things work, we could say it's different. Let's say, you know, like say it's a modern day example. Let's say with, you know, internet connections, right? Or let's say with, with, with a phone call, like we all know that it's, it could potentially any point drop, right? It could. Will it necessarily happen? No, but is there a significant chance? Yes. So, so would you say that this is considered to be somebody's responsibility or not? And do both people have equal responsibility for that? And that's, and that's an interesting question, which can very much depend on the circumstances. So again, this, so this is the opinion of, this is, this is the Shulchan Aruch, and as far as the, right, we, no, no, notice they also mentioned here, the word um, that he mentioned, that, that there's, there's the mentioning of the, of, of, of everybody's knowledge of it, as well as their, as well as well as what the practice of the what's, what's used what normally is the practice right and similarly if the worker did not know the practice of the river but the employer did however the employer must pay him like an idle worker so but even though you but you wouldn't necessarily get paid the same amount as in let's say if you got paid as a highly skilled worker but now it's not like and then it dries up you knew that it could have happened you're not required to give him the full payment either so again then you're that because the reality is, is that again, you're required to pay a minim minimal amount, but it does get full payment, seemingly not in the case of any, this extenuating circumstance. So, uh, so now, then we have the Rama, who's going to, again, Rama, Ramos Yisselis, contemporary, contemporary of Joseph Cairo. So he had, been, so he was over in Poland, Krakow at the, top, at the same time as Joseph Cairo. So he wrote um, a commentary uh, on the Shulchan Aruch called the, called the Rama, where he, or the mapa, the map, basically, because he is, uh, sorry, the, the tablecloth, because he is, he adds certain things to help explain what th things in the Shulchan Aruch, most, a lot of the time, simply difference between, you know, Ashkenazim and Sfaradim, right, different practices, because, you know, Rabbi Yosef Cairo was from the, um, from the, from the, far, was from farther east, whereas Rabbi Yosef Cairo is part of northern slash western Europe, which is different, um, 
Yes, I see that um, that the Moshe is best to be said. He's also referred to as the footnote Haga, right? But that, right, so he himself calls himself right. So he, when he writes it, he writes it in as as, as note because he wrote himself in as secondary to the Shulchan Aruch. He was being he was deferring to the um, he was deferring to the Shulchan Aruch, which was written first. Even though he himself had written a similar work that very similar to the Shulchan Aruch, he decided to not publish it because he felt it was more it was more suitable to join together and have one book that everybody could hopefully use. So, but okay. So that's a little bit about the Ramah. But let's get to, let's get back to our case. So hopefully we'll. So 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 here's his note. The same applies to any unavoidable accident that occurred to the workers, regardless of whether both knew it was typical for the accident to occur or neither knew, and the worker would suffer the loss. The employer knew, and the worker did not. However, the employer would suffer the loss if it was a communal plague. For meaning, sorry. So this this was discussed. Um, last week by Rector Chiener, the case of Makat Medina, which means that it's completely beyond your control. So you can't simply say tough luck because it, it it's not just your luck, it's the everybody in the region. So there it's a little bit different. So again, so when everybody's saying that, how is that possibly for you to get paid? So the answer is it depends on what the degree of duress it is. If it's of the degree of duress, which is a region-wide um, issue, then you're right. So the, the worker should be getting paid. But again, as far as the discussion of, of does or doesn't get paid, please see Robert Turner's here from last week. We don't have time to get through that fully today. Okay. Um, so, okay. So, if one rented a house to live in, this is another case that uh, quoted by the Ramah, and died within the rental period, he would only have to pay for the amount he lived there because the owner is like a worker. And he should have made the condition, right? So basically, it was the same for, like from the estate afterwards. So somebody had been, you know, was, was renting from somebody else, and then they passed away in the middle. So for the, the, his family's estate would only have to pay, um, should have to pay the full amount because you know that it was beyond his control. The person would die, right? That, that's an onus, right? The beyond your control, somebody's death. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't control that. So there are those who disagree, however. So. So thus, but they're all, again, it's my flow game. So it's, it's disputes, therefore, kind of stuck in the middle here. Thus, if the owner already received the, rent, the full rental payment, he would not have to return anything. This seems uh, to be like the correct way to rule. If the employer fled because of a change in the air, um, it is like any other avoidable um, accident and the worker or the school teacher would suffer loss. The change in the air, we mean, um, like meaning that it was viewed to be a dangerous area, not just like you know he he decided to run away. Um, we mean there's like actual good reason for him to run away. Then then you would say sorry. Yeah, you're not you're, you're not liable. Okay, but again, it very much depends. A lot of these things are subjective based on where does it fall. As we'll see from the next case, you mentioned you know uh, should you be paid fully? So that's exactly this case. So sorry. Uh, right. So sorry. Let me switch to English because we're out of, we're out of time. So if one hired a, hired a worker to irrigate his field and it rained at night in a way that the employer no longer needed the worker, he would not pay him anything. So similarly, if it rained halfway through the day, he would not pay him anything from the halfway point on. If a river came, however, he must pay for all their wages. They were assisted from the heavens. Right. So the question comes down to what is within their control versus not within their control, and could he and and who's it helping in each case. So depending on 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 on, on which way which way it goes, that would depend. So similarly, then now we switch again. Whenever we remember, the red and black is the shulchan aruch. That red is that of the rama. Apologize if not all the translations switch back and forth properly. Okay, so yeah, now the rama adds: if one hired to dig his field and arrange at night in a way that they can no longer dig, the workers did not see the land. The employer was suffering the loss because he should have told them not to come. Right. So a lot of it comes down to. At what point did this? Did we know that things get noticed? There are those who say that if the employer investigated the work at night and saw and, and saw workers were needed. He would be exempt in all cases. Again, see above. Again, whether or not this was sufficiently did, did each of them do their proper due diligence or not. Again, it's very a lot of these cases are very subjective, and you have to take to court to decide was he who is negligent or not negligent in a given case. There are those who say that this that we said if it is a notable accident occurred, then the workers would suffer loss is only where he hired them for a specific job. If he hired them without specification, however. Or you can say, give me another job like this one. So here, there's the question of switching the job on somebody. You hire somebody straight, and the question is, can you change it up on them? So the answer is, is that yes, you can, but only but within limits. 
So, right, so there is certain degrees where you can, but again, you can't deviate too far. So you have, somebody hired you, let's say for, you know, uh, to, to, do their, to do their accounting work and instead asked you to do, to, to do their um, expense sheet. So then you, you, you could argue that they're similar enough, but if they told you, oh, you know numbers, you want to, you have to teach my, like, you know, and you finish taxes, they're like, you want to tutor my kid in math instead? Like, you, that's not necessarily a reasonable expectation that you could just simply transfer it over because that is not necessarily a similar enough job to allow you to do that, okay? All right, so I think we're going to have to, unfortunately, skip, this, um, skip the case of the, um, of, of the, of the teacher um, because, again, but you wonder whether or not I'm required to pay or not, I'll just look at one line is that um, the, the you, why you have to actually pay the teacher is because all who teach prefer teaching over being idle, so therefore that's why they get paid the full amount as opposed to getting paid the amount that a worker gets paid of, you know, just the minimal amount if you were a if you were laying idle. Why that's the case is an excellent question. Um, for more on that, we'll have to talk about that another time. Again, but again, throughout all this, a lot again, let's just let's review the factors are again degree of just to summarize the question is degree of of, of expectation. Is it be is it unavoidable or unavoidable? Who, what level of liability does the particular worker employer have in regards to the situation? And did the, each of them do their due diligence in regards to making sure that everything was done properly? So the combination of those three factors will be whether or not the person gets paid or doesn't get paid. And again, every case is very complex as to who gets who gets preferred preferential treatment or payment. And so we'll have to, uh, so as far as for, for any for exact cases, please consult your local court. Please don't ask me because I don't actually know. Okay, but some last points that we should, that, that, that are, I think are important for everybody to know as workers. So what, so this is saying like, can you fix payment, I say payment, but there's other things that are, that, that are important to know as a worker as well. So here we have, this is the, the last law of, of the Rambam in the laws of hiring. So this is the end, after he had, he, he's been summarizing all that we've been talking about until now, and then he decides to close with this. That just as the employers warn against robbing the wage of the poor workman and against delaying it, so is the poor workman warned against robbing the employer by idling away his time on the job, a little here, a little there, thus wasting the entire day deceitfully. He must be scrupulous throughout the time of work. Also, he's required to work to the best of ability, as the upright Jacob said, I have served your father with all my strength. As I believe uh, Miriam, Mir Miriam quoted earlier, right? So like, the Yaakov story is very much relevant to this as well. But that's more in terms of the, a little bit in terms of the uh, beyond the, a little bit towards the, almost on the level beyond. Like this is the spirit of the law. So for this reason, he was rewarded even in this world as it was written, the man became exceedingly rich. So if you want to make sure that things go really well, make sure you make sure make sure you are as scrupulous as you can in these details. And lastly, right, as far as the degree of seriousness, so again, so there's this year, the last one we have is Rabbi Yaakov um, blowing um, in Pitre Hoshan, where he says that. You have to be. You have to be very stringent because we we see that even that that if we go if you're looking through um, through, through Gemara Brachot that we that we even cut off learning, uh, meaning you can't finish benching, you can't finish, um, or let's say even uh, you, you you skip the fourth bracha benching, you might even not even be able to say full shmona esrei. Right, you might need to say, you might need to, you know, say Kriyat Shema while you're in the tree. So all these things are are are, are you're potentially exempted from different points according to according to Chazal, according to the sages and, and the and the Talmud, because that's just how important it is to make sure that you do your work properly and diligently. So what does this mean for us? Well, that's an excellent question. But I'd simply like to leave off everybody with um, well, again. Before I leave the last word, again, please send me, if you have not yet, send me your, send me your, send me your email and your name. That way we can make sure that we get you the um, information properly. But either way, um, I just want to close with some, some food for thought as how we should go about our business practices in terms of our degree responsibility. So, well, one is a tax question, which I'd be happy somebody can talk, give me the answer to. So can we credit a tax deduction for our due diligence expenses, such as paying for our insurance, our backups, right? Is that considered to be a valid thing to do? Also, to what extent do we need to go? There's accepted practice. And then there's the question of going beyond that. 
if there's this new cutting edge technology that would help improve my ability to work, am I required to get it? And, and could I bill for it? Or would I say that until it becomes accepted, accepted practice, it's not my responsibility, the employer can pay for that. So, yeah. So does anybody have any questions? Or answers? Yes, Miriam. I'm thinking of, a, if, if you don't mind, a very specific situation in Thornhill. I'm a dog walker, let's say, and I'm walking through the park with the dogs. At this point, should I know that we have a coyote issue and I'm 100% responsible if anything happens or not everybody knows about the coyotes? Like, it, does that fall under this rubric too, this kind of idea? Yeah, that's actually one of the cases we had, right? If there's, if there's an area that's known to be besieged by wolves, right? So would we, so would we say in the modern context that knowing that there are coyotes around, so I, when, I'm, when, I'm, when I'm walking the little Yorkies, should I be worried that they're gonna get you know, snatched up or not? Or not walk through the park. Or, or not walk through the park, right. Or not take as many dogs as I used to before. Correct, so make sure there's-, there's something you can, Right, so maybe you should only take two or three, that way you can theory run the other way. That also comes down to is it one coyote or two coyotes, right? And do they come from one way or from both ways, right? If you just get surrounded, um, then that might be a problem. But if let's say it's from one way, it's like just run, just run away, like it's not gonna really catch you. So again, a lot of this comes down to what's considered to be safe and expected, because I'm pretty sure most people don't have such high expectations for dog walkers, if I had to bet, right? It's not like the, right? So again, but again, a lot of it comes down to what is considered to be within expectation and, and uh, how dangerous. Again, I don't know how dangerous coyotes are, so like I can't really. Meaning the local coyotes, like I, I, I don't know, like are they are they scared of people or not? Like, like all these things are relevant. As like you know, a one person had their you know one little dog got taken. It's different than you know, you know these dogs are roaming around and nobody will is willing to let their dog you know outside of their backyard for fear of it being attacked. So. But. Very gray. The whole thing is very gray. There's a lot of permutations there's, in this. Correct, a lot of permutations, and there's a lot of facts you need to establish in order to, in order to properly um, uh, conclude. So, yeah. So then, yes, but yes, it's funny that the modern day context, the dog turned went from being the thing that's supposed to guard you or being dangerous to being the flock. But that's a separate question. The dogs became the sheep. Yeah. So, any other questions? I think your point about going above also works to the example of the power outage. Your computer goes down doesn't necessarily mean you should stop working. There might be other work that you can do. Right. So that that's excellent, Eddie. Right. So the question is, when you're going beyond what we normally do, so to what extent? Um, and, and how much, but would you say that, but I did lose 20 minutes. You'd say like the, my computer crashing, like, so then the fact that I, lo I lost time trying to get, you know, get this thing set up might be reasonable, but to say that, you know, I forgot, to, I never say my work all day long would be a, well, why on earth do you not say to work at all the entirety of the day? That just seems irresponsible, right? So, those, so, the, so parts, so for part of it, you'd say, right, that you should get paid for, but part of it, maybe not. So. Yeah. Any any more questions? All right. So again, it's all in the recording here.